Imagine standing at the edge of a vast ancient landscape, peering into a time over 45,000 years ago when modern humans first ventured beyond the cradle of Africa. What drove them to leave? Where did they go next? These questions swirl around the origins of Eurasians, those diverse peoples who eventually populated Europe, Asia and beyond. A fascinating clue emerges from a skull found in Zlaty Kun, Czechia, a relic of one of the earliest known modern humans in Eurasia. This individual, a woman who lived more than 45,000 years ago, offers a genomic window into our deep past. Her mitochondrial DNA belongs to haplogroup N, a lineage that sparks curiosity and debate. Could this genetic marker suggest that modern Eurasians originated not in the Middle East, as often assumed, but in South or Southeast Asia? The Campanian Ignimbrite eruption around 39,000 years ago, noted in the study, could have disrupted later populations, explaining why Zulati Kun shows no continuity with post-40,000 year Eurasians. Was this volcanic event a turning point? wiping out early pioneers like her people and paving the way for new waves. Let's dive into this tantalizing possibility, weaving together the threads of genetics, archaeology, and a little bit of speculation to explore what Zlati Kun might reveal about our shared ancestry. This woman was not an ancestor of modern Europeans and is more closely related to some ancient East Asians. The story begins with the out-of-Africa migration, a pivotal chapter in human history. Sometime between 70,000 and 60,000 years ago, modern humans, Homo sapiens, stepped out of Africa, likely crossing into the Arabian Peninsula. From there, the traditional narrative points to the Middle East as a staging ground, a place where these pioneers interbred with Neanderthals before fanning out across Eurasia. The Zlati Kun genome aligns with this timeline, carrying about 3% Neanderthal ancestry a signature of that early encounter. But here's where it gets intriguing. The lengths of her Neanderthal DNA segments are longer than those found in other early Eurasians, like the 45,000-year-old Ust Ishim individual from Siberia. Neanderthals passed on genes for cold-weather adaptations that allowed early Eurasians to live in colder climates. These include genes for metabolism and pigmentation, such as lighter skin, blonde and red hair, and blue eyes. These genes did not become dominant in Europe until later, but the genes were present in these early Europeans over 40,000 years ago. However, her Neanderthal DNA segments are much shorter than Oase 1, a 42,000-year-old modern human from Romania who had nearly 10% Neanderthal DNA. Oase 1 also descends from haplogroup N, but even though he is a few thousand years younger than Zlati Kun woman, his version of haplogroup N is considered to be an older or more basal version. But why might that be? Longer Neanderthal segments suggest fewer generations of recombination, meaning Zlati Kun could be closer in time to that initial Neanderthal mixing event than previously thought. If so, where were her ancestors when it happened? Could it have been farther east than the Middle East, perhaps in a region like South or Southeast Asia? Haplogroup N, identified in Zlati Kun's mitochondrial DNA, adds fuel to this speculation. Mitochondrial DNA, passed down through the maternal line, acts like a genetic breadcrumb trail, tracing the movements of ancient populations. Haplogroup N is a broad and ancient lineage emerging shortly after humans left Africa. Today, it's widespread across Eurasia, with branches like N1, N2, and R radiating into Europe, Asia, and even Oceania. But where did it first take root? Some researchers propose that Haplogroup N originated in a population hub outside Africa, possibly in West Asia. Yet, the diversity and distribution of its subclades, especially its presence in South and Southeast Asia, raise a compelling question. What if this hub wasn't in the Middle East, but farther east, in a region like South or Southeast Asia? Zlati Kun's basal position in the Eurasian genetic tree, as shown in her nuclear DNA, suggests she belonged to a population that predates the split between Europeans and Asians. Could her lineage hint at an eastern cradle for haplogroup N? one that shaped the ancestors of modern Eurasians. Picture South Asia 50,000 years ago, a lush, resource-rich subcontinent teeming with rivers, forests and coastlines. Or envision Southeast Asia, a tropical crossroads with archipelagos stretching toward Australia. 
These regions weren't isolated backwaters. They were dynamic landscapes, potentially ideal for sustaining early human populations after their African exodus. Archaeological evidence supports this idea. In India, sites like Jwalapuram in Andhra Pradesh reveal stone tools dated to around 74,000 years ago, coinciding with the Toba super eruption, a cataclysm that might have pushed humans to adapt and migrate. These tools resemble those of African Middle Stone Age cultures, suggesting a direct link to out of Africa migrants. In Southeast Asia, finds like the 66,000 year old remains from Tampa Ling in Laos hint at an early human presence. Could these areas have been more than waypoints? Might they have served as a population hub where haplogroup N emerged and diversified before spreading westward to Europe and eastward to Asia? Zlati Kun's genome offers a tantalizing piece of this puzzle. Her mitochondrial DNA belonging to haplogroup N aligns with an early, undifferentiated lineage, one that doesn't show a clear connection to later Europeans or Asians. This basal status suggests she was part of a population that branched off before the major Eurasian divergence, estimated around 45,000 to 40,000 years ago. If haplogroup N originated in South or Southeast Asia, Zlati Kun's ancestors could have been part of a westward migration from that eastern hub, carrying this genetic signature into Europe. Her Neanderthal ancestry, with those notably long segments, supports this timeline. Estimates suggest the admixture event occurred 70 to 80 generations before she lived, roughly 2,000 to 2,400 years, assuming a generation span of 30 years. If she died around 45,000 years ago, this places the Neanderthal mixing around 47,000 to 47,400 years ago, potentially in a region east of the Middle East where her population lingered before moving into Europe. But why South or Southeast Asia over the Middle East? The Middle East has long been the favoured candidate for the post-Africa hub, given its geographic proximity to Africa and the evidence of Neanderthal human interbreeding there. Sites like Skul and Kafsir in Israel, dated to over 100,000 years ago, show early modern humans alongside Neanderthals. Yet, the genetic diversity of haplogroup N tells a different story. Its subclades, such as R, which gave rise to many European and Asian lineages, show greater variety in South Asia than in West Asia. Could the Middle East have been a stepping stone, with South or Southeast Asia as the true nursery for Eurasian diversity? Zalati Kun's lack of genetic continuity with later Europeans or Asians supports this shift in perspective. She might represent a remnant of an early wave that originated farther east, only to be replaced or absorbed by later migrations. Now, let's explore the journey. Imagine a band of early humans trekking from Africa through the Arabian Peninsula, perhaps following coastlines or river valleys. They reach South or Southeast Asia, settling in a fertile region where they thrive for millennia. Here they encounter Neanderthals blending their genes into the modern human pool. Haplogroup N emerges in this hub, diversifying as the population grows. Then climatic shifts or population pressures push some groups westward. By 45,000 years ago, they reach Europe, leaving traces like Zlati Kun in Czechia. Others move eastward, eventually reaching Siberia and beyond. This model flips the traditional narrative. Instead of a linear spread from the Middle East, it envisions a dynamic hub in the east, radiating outwards. What do you think? Could this eastern origin explain the genetic patterns we see today? The archaeological record offers clues to test this hypothesis. In India, the Middle Paleolithic tools at sites like Vimbetka and Patna suggest a long human presence with some artefacts dated to over 50,000 years ago. These tools transition into Upper Paleolithic forms around 40,000 years ago, mirroring the technological shift seen in Europe with individuals like Zlati Kun, whose Upper Paleolithic context aligns with this time frame. If these regions were a hub, We'd expect genetic and cultural continuity between them and early Eurasians like Slati Kun. Her haplogroup N could be the thread tying these distant dots together, a marker born in the East carried west by her ancestors. But how did they travel so far? Were they following game, seeking new lands or fleeing sea level rise? Genetics adds another layer of intrigue. Slati Kun's nuclear DNA places her as basal to both Ust-Ishim 
and later Eurasians like Tianyuan and Sunghe. Ust Ishim from Siberia shares more alleles with later Eurasians, suggesting he's a step closer to the European-Asian split. Zlati Kun, by contrast, seems frozen in time, a snapshot of an earlier population. If her lineage originated in South or Southeast Asia, it might explain this basal position. Her people could have been an early offshoot, migrating west before the main Eurasian divergence. The longer Neanderthal segments in her genome further suggest she's closer to the original admixture event than Ust Ishim, whose segments are shorter, indicating more generations of recombination. Could this mean Zlati Kun's ancestors mixed with Neanderthals in Asia, not the Middle East, before heading to Europe? Consider the broader context of haplogroup N. Its descendant, haplogroup R, is a powerhouse, giving rise to major European lineages like H and U, and Asian lineages like B and F. Today, haplogroup R's diversity peaks in South Asia, with India hosting some of its oldest branches. Southeast Asia, meanwhile, shows early traces of N and R in populations that later reached Australia and New Guinea. If haplogroup N arose in this eastern hub, it could have spread westward with groups like Slati Kuns, while other branches moved south and east. This aligns with a study which proposes a population hub out of Africa, though it doesn't pinpoint South or Southeast Asia explicitly. Zlati Kun's confirmation as the most basal Eurasian sequence to date reinforces this idea. Her genome could be a relic of that hub, rooted in an Eastern origin. What might this mean for our understanding of human migration? Could South or Southeast Asia have been the true launchpad for Eurasian diversity? Yet challenges remain. The Middle East's archaeological record, rich with early human fossils and Neanderthal sites, can't be dismissed. Zalati Kun's Neanderthal ancestry aligns with a mixing event often placed in West Asia, where Neanderthal ranges overlapped with modern humans. If this happened in South or Southeast Asia, we'd need evidence of Neanderthals farther east, which is sparse. Denisovans, known from Siberia and Southeast Asia, are a possible alternative but Zlati Kun's archaic ancestry matches Neanderthal patterns, not Denisovan ones. Perhaps her ancestors encountered Neanderthals en route from an eastern hub, blending genes in a transitional zone before reaching Europe. Or maybe our map of Neanderthal distribution is incomplete. Could they have roamed farther east than we think? Climate and geography bolster the eastern hub idea. Around 50,000 years ago, South and Southeast Asia offered stable, warm environments. Unlike the harsher steppes of West Asia, sea levels were lower, exposing land bridges like the Sunda Shelf. These conditions could have supported a thriving population hub, giving rise to haplogroup N. As the last glacial maximum approached, cooling climates might have driven groups westward, bringing Zlati Kun's lineage to Europe. Finally, let's zoom out and reflect. Zlati Kun's genome, with its haplogroup N and basal status, challenges us to rethink Eurasian origins. And South or Southeast Asia hub offers a fresh lens, a vibrant eastern cradle, where modern humans paused, mixed with archaic neighbours, and diversified before radiating across the continent. Her long Neanderthal segments suggest proximity to that mixing event, possibly in or near this hub. The archaeological echoes, tools in South remains in Southeast Asia, whisper of an early presence, while haplogroup N's diversity points eastward questions linger. How do we reconcile this with Middle Eastern evidence? What drove these migrations, curiosity, survival, or something else? And what other genomes still buried in ancient soil might confirm or upend this story? Zlati Kun stands as a sentinel, her skull a silent testament to a journey that began far from Czechia. If South or Southeast Asia was the hub, she's a bridge between continents, her haplogroup N, a beacon of an eastern door. Where do you think our story began? Could the answers lie in the jungles of Southeast Asia or the plains of India, waiting to rewrite the map of our past? As science unearths more clues, the tale of Zlati Kun invites us to wonder, to question, and to keep searching for the roots of who we are.